and daughters of the living God because of his grace to us. How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us that we should be considered sons and daughters of his. And that's exactly what we are. Now that is John who says that to us, but I just want us to keep that in our thinking. We are, because of his grace, sons and daughters of his. Now I don't want you to go around arrogantly, but I want you to understand, as we've just talked about today, aren't you thankful for Jesus' life and death? That his life and death ensures for us that we are loved children of God. And John says that's exactly who we are. So we're sons and daughters by his grace. But as any parent would know, well, let me step back one step. Can you remember when your kids were young, if you had kids, and there was that thought in your mind, I wish my kids could stay this age for the rest of their life. But that's not life, is it? And even within us as parents, we want our kids to grow up. We want our kids to grow up as mature people, as people that take on responsibility, that become productive citizens of our country, that do something in their life that's productive. And most of all, we want them to grow up and know the God who created them. That's the same way that it is with you and me. God lavishes his love on us, but he wants us to grow in him. And we're in this series called Reset, Resetting the Priorities of Our Life. And I thought on this third week of this series that it would be good for us to just talk about growing in Jesus. That's surely his intention for us. Anything that's going to be healthy has to grow. Any cell in your body, any tissue that becomes necrotic, what's it do? It dies. So what I want to talk about today is a few things. I want to give you 10 evidences in just a moment. But I thought it would be good for us, if we can, to turn to 2 Peter. And 2 Peter is the second of two letters that Peter writes to the church. And it is in the latter oh, two-thirds of the New Testament. And for you that might be at home, grab your Bibles. I'll give you a little bit of a prompt here. Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, and James. And then you come to the first book of Peter. Go through that, and you'll come to the second book of Peter. And we're going to look at 2 Peter, the first chapter. So this is 2 Peter, first chapter. And we're going to take a look at verse 3. And we're going to read down probably through verse 8, if we can, today. The words will be on the screen for you at home and for those of you in our sanctuary that don't have a Bible. And if you have one, please start bringing it. It'd be great for you to find a companion for your life, whether that's on your phone or whether that's a hard copy that I have right here. There's no problem. But whatever you feel like will be a good companion for you to have in your life, I want you to grab that and bring it with you when you come to church on Sundays or Wednesdays or whenever you have groups or whatever it may be. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Peter starts off and says, Grace and peace to you. This is verse 2. Be yours in abundance to your knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And we see here that God's divine power, verse 3, has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. So Peter is saying that God has given us his power. He wants us to grow. But first of all, as this is the case all the time, God does something first for us and in us. And Peter says, I want you to know this, that God has given us his divine power to help us with the changes he wants. He never asks us to do something that he doesn't provide the grace and the strength to do it. And then he says, verse 4, Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. We can and should participate in the divine nature of Jesus. Our call is to become like Jesus. That's what that means, our divine nature that the very nature of God can be in and through us, through his spirit. And some of us may be here today saying, this whole Holy Spirit thing gets me all the time, Pastor. I've seen some pretty shaky things being done through the Holy Spirit. I've seen people do all No. 
This is what it means. That when you come to trust in Jesus, his spirit, his presence and power, his divine nature becomes a part of your life. He lives his life in and through us. And Peter is saying, God has given us his power through his divine nature to grow. So verse five says, for this very reason, make every effort. Oh, pastor, we can't work, can we? Because if we work, isn't that like works righteousness? Nothing can be further from the truth. When you begin to know Jesus, you'll want to be like him. It's not a matter of you trying to earn anything. It's simply the fact that he wants us to grow and will be willing to provide the effort, strengthened by his grace, but you and I are called to provide effort in becoming like Jesus in our life. And he says, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, to goodness, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, Godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love, 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 <laughs> love. I just want you to hear that. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measures, you get that? They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus' presence and power is within us to provide what we need to grow into Christ-likeness in our life. Whenever you hear the word godliness in the New Testament, just think like Jesus. We'll never be perfect. We'll never be able to be absolutely like him. There's no perfection in absoluteness, no. But we can become like Jesus in our life. That's surely what Peter is talking about here. And we can come to understand that God's grace will help us at every turn, but we must be willing, as he says here in verse five, to put forth the effort to train ourselves in spiritual formation. But look where Peter's progression always goes. We start with faith and we wind up with love. Throughout the New Testament, this is kind of a list that Peter gives us for a progression in growing in grace, but Paul does the same thing. We'll talk more about this on Wednesday night. But in Colossians and other places, in Romans, Paul does the same thing. He puts these quality traits in different order, but it always winds up with love. The goal of the Christian life is to inhabit and to express and to have Christ's love in our life. Peter says we're to grow in all these different things, but it always winds up in love. And all growth in the Christian life, for you and for me, will wind up with knowing, experiencing, passing on Jesus' love in our practical life. Now, see, many of us read these things and we say, uh, who knows this, you've heard this at weddings, and many of you, oh, this is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient, love is kind, it keeps no record of wrongs. All these, and we say, oh, that's what I'm going to do. When you say that, you are putting the cart before the horse, what Peter and Paul, don't go, I always want to say Peter and Paul and what? Mary, Mary okay, don't do that. Uh, but all the New Testament writers say this, if you set yourself off and just think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this, I'm not going to keep records of wrongs, I'm going to be more patient, I'm going to be more kind, uh, okay, I'll just do it. If you do that, you are short-sighting and short-circuiting what Jesus wants to see. He wants us to be people that are inhabited by and possessed by what? His love. All these progressions wind up in love. You know why? Because when you know God's love through and expressed through Jesus in your life, you'll be the kind of person who won't want to keep long records of wrongs. When you know Jesus' love in your life, you will want to be more kind. Why? Because you are experiencing the kindness of Jesus in your own life. You see how it works? You never try to do something. You always try to become someone so that the love of God can give you the strength and the ability and the experience of having something before you give it away. You can't become more kind unless you become 
experienced of kindness by Jesus yourself. And I just want you to know today, as you think about growing in grace, oh, here, I got to give effort. I got to give. We do. But our effort is not in us trying to check lists off of all these different things. It is becoming the type of person who would be willing to be kind. And for all of our issues in our life today, if you would just step back and say, you know what, I'm going to get my eyes off of just simply trying to put a checklist of things I'm going to do. If I would then become a person who grows in grace enough to become a type of person, now you're on the right track in your life. Is that understood? Do you understand my point here? Growth is always the case. Now, uh, when I really began to take my faith seriously, graduating from high school, going into college, I really started to see what Jesus wanted for my life. And there was a man who showed up on In Touch Ministries on TV named Charles Stanley. Does anybody know the name Charles Stanley? Now, we come from different traditions, and we see things a little differently in some ways, but that man really began to help me to understand what it meant practically to become a follower of Jesus. And in 1988, he gave 10 evidences of a growing Christian. I've had it ever since. And every once in a while, I go back and look at it and say to myself, man, this is a good thing for me to look at. This is a good thing. Oh, man. I, I, and I just want to give these to you now, just as a point of logistics here. I'm going to break them down and go one by one by one. I'm going to give you the first five and then six through ten. Don't worry about writing them down. I'm going to give you the comprehensive all ten on a slide. So at the end, you can just take a picture and take them home and use them for your own life. So don't worry about making copious notes. I just want you to hear these one by one by one and say to yourself, these help me to understand. I may see these in my life now. I may not. It's not here to give you a sense of guilt. It's simply to give you a sense of which, if I am a growing person, if the presence and power of Jesus is in my life, these things will become more a part of my life. We okay with that? Give me five minutes and we'll get through them. The first one is this. The first evidence that you are growing in Jesus is a growing hunger for God in your heart. The horizon is Jesus. You, you, whatever you're doing in your life, you just have this pursuit, like, I, I want to know Jesus. That's what a growing Christian will want. Second, an increasing desire to know the truth of God's word. I say this to you all the time, that God's word is not just something to be read, but it begins to read us. And God's power is in the written word of God, which testifies to his living word, Jesus. And when we, when we begin to love God's word, Jesus begins to really powerfully move in our life. Jesus begins to read us. Amen to that? That's what Scripture is all about. Third, a greater sensitivity to sin in one's life. That's kind of uh, intuitively wrong for many of us. We think, okay, if I'm in Jesus, uh, I'm not going to have a desire to worry about the things of my life that may be sinful. The reality is when you experience his grace and understand he loves you no matter what, and he's beginning to move in your life, you're able to say, you know what? I'm able to see my life more clearly. See, that's what Jesus does for us in our life. Christians should be the most honest, have the most integrity in life because they can understand Jesus, you know what? He accepts me for who I am, but he's taken me to a place in my life whereby I can really say, and know that he's living and working in my life, and he's working through these issues in my life that I can see. Aren't you thankful that Jesus takes you right where you are? Amen to that? But these things in our life that we have to move that are missing the mark, that's what sin is. It's just simply missing the mark of how Jesus wants for us in our life. And we're saying, you know what? As I'm beginning to know Jesus, I'm beginning to see more and more in my life that I want him to help me work through. Fourth, a decreasing desire for the world system. We don't want to live by pride. 
Many of us have lived by lust for a lot of our life. We don't want to, not that we come to a point where it's just all gone. This is a long earthly pursuit, but we're seeing more and more, and we're able to detect more and more the way the world operates, and we're willing to say, you know what, no more. The way the world loves things and hates people, or the way the world loves things and uses people, I'm not going to do that anymore. It may take me all my life, but I'm going to set off and say, you know what, I'm not going to let the world set the agenda for my life anymore. Jesus is going to set the agenda for my life. I want to be like him. And sometimes you have to roll upstream in doing so. But you have an increasing desire to love Jesus and a decreasing desire to live by the ways of this world. Amen to that one? Fifth, one sphere of love is continually increasing. Do you see your love quotient gaining in your life? Do you have a sense of what you're seeing? You know what? I want to love the people of my life. I'm learning through Jesus how to love. It's a sacrifice, but I'm willing to sacrifice and give myself to these different people. Maybe your spouse, maybe your kids, maybe to a friend, a worker at work. I'm not letting these people just go by anymore. They're becoming more a part of my life, and I'm saying, I want to love these people. That's the way it is when you're growing in Jesus. And that's the first five, six through ten. One finds it easier and easier to forgive and forget the things that people don't. See, this is one for me. Uh, the whole keeping no record of wrongs, that's where Jesus has to work in my life. I, I, I need to grow in that sense of being willing and able and living with a sense of which it's gone. I don't want to deal with it anymore. Because when you hold on to regrets and grudges, who's hurt? We are. The other person may not even know anymore. So my thing is, this is worse. See, I'm not beyond this. This is one of those things I need. Lord, help my love to grow for people, to forgive them and to forget and go on and say, I'm not going to become uh, less or, I'm, you know, I've been got my nose scruffed up a little bit when I try to, to love this person. So therefore, look what happened. So I'm just going to pull back and become shriveled up in my heart to love people. No, I'm just going to love people. I'm going to be willing to help them as I've been forgiven. I'm going to forgive them as God's forgiven my sin. I'm going to forgive them and forget that as well. Seven, an increasing desire to obey God. You just see things and places in your life and you say, Lord, I want to obey you right here. Even when I don't know what's going on in my life, who's there? Who's there in your life right now? You may not even know what's going on a year from now. You, you don't know. Our kids are going back to school. Many are going back to school to college. And you're, what, what do we ask them? So what are you going to do? And they're like, I don't have a God. That was the way I was when I was 18. But it's like, Lord, wherever it may be, I'm going to obey you. Whatever it may be, Lord, I'm going to trust you in this situation of my life. Eight, an ever-increasing faith in God. Can you see your faith in saying, the Lord's not done here. I'm going to trust God through this. Now, that's not to say we can become foolish, but we need faith-filled people in churches that are able to help us know, you know what? Let's step out in faith. Let's do something for Jesus right here. Is that the way it is in your life, Lord? I, I want to have an ever-increasing faith that my faith in you is beyond what I can see. I'm going to trust you to work. And oftentimes, as your kids, let's just go back. When you're babies, you can't even speak. When you're a little kid, you're just learning how to speak. When you're an adult, you, that's the way it is. We begin to grow in our faith. And we've seen Jesus work here. We've seen him work here. And we're saying, well, if you can do it there, you can surely do it over here as well. Have you had faith-filled people in your life? speak a better word into your life. I hope that is the case with your life as well as mine. Jesus can speak a better word for us, and we don't have to become fearful. We don't have to give up on our hopes and dreams. We can say, the Lord, you I say amen to this, and this is what the Bible says. With God, all things are what? Possible. Don't you want to become that kind of a person? that looks at the issues of life and we can say to ourselves, you know what, I'm going to put this in the Lord's hands and he may or may not 
but I'm going to trust that the Lord can do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine. I want to be a kind of person who has a growing faith. Nine is this. In an ever-increasing concern for the spiritual condition of the people of my life. You don't go around and slam people on top of the head with your Bible. That's not what I mean by that. That's not what I mean by that. But your heart begins to beat for the conditions of other people. There's a healthy sense of concern. There's a healthy sense of burden for the people in your life. You are beginning to see how Jesus has been faithful in helping you, and you just have a natural sense of which I want that for that person. I want this for this person. This concerns me. I hope every one of us can be people that brings light and hope and help into the people of our life. Wouldn't you want to be that kind of a person? That doesn't mean you go to every person and say, I'm going to give you the four spiritual laws. Listen, right now. No. It's just that when people who have this sense of godly concern for people, it lifts up people. It encourages people. You become part of their life, and you begin to pray for them and help them, and you become a light to them. That's the kind of person that we can be. And you don't have to be a jerk. You don't have to be arrogant. You don't have to be religious. You don't have to quote scripture to them. When, when God opens an opportunity, walk through it. But the best thing you'd ever do is this. I want to be a person who develops a burden, and I'm going to begin to pray and care for and help the people of my life. Amen to that one? And there are many Christians who live their life, and that is not even a possible. Grow with that. Grow in your desire to help people. Last one with this. One's feelings for God are deeper and more intimate. You're just having a deeper sense. You're learning. You're growing. Is it this way in your life? I hope every one of us is able to, but let's just take it back to our parents. And I hope you're willing to do this. You should be a parent to your kids. I know a lot of parents, their kids are 13, 14, and they're wanting to be your buddy, buddy. Friend, can I say this to you, mom or dad? You need to parent your kid. Now, I hope along the way that they respect you enough, but there's a time and a place for you to be their parent first. That's what God wants for your life. But as you grow and as you get older in your life, there comes this point where you're able to have a relationship of love and concern and friendship with your older kids. That's the way that it is with us. As you walk with Jesus, you're able to have deeper thoughts and feelings and insights about life. And when you grow, your feelings of God are going to become deeper and more intimate. Throw up this last slide here. It has all 10 for you. So this is your time, if you want to, just to click on this and say, this is a way to get all 10 on one slide. And I can take this home and I can have this for my use. But I just want you to think about this. Are these evidences becoming something that you can see? Now listen, not all of them. We're all in process. The Christian life is a journey. It's not a destination. But can we look at this and say to ourselves, you know, some of these things, yep, I see this in my rearview mirror. I can see looking back that I'm growing in my life. Some of these I really need to work on. And Jesus, would you help me? Would you grow this within me? Second Peter winds up, Peter ends this little short letter. And in chapter 3, verse 18, this is what he says. He's concluding his letter, and he says, what is the last thing that I could tell these people? What is the last thing that I want to share with these people who are going to receive this note? What's he say? Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That was his concern, that when people read this and then ended it, they would understand we are to grow in Jesus. For whose glory is your life, friend? Look what he says, grow in your faith, your knowledge of Jesus. For what reason? So that your life can bring him glory both now and forevermore. See, our lives will show something in the end. Is your life about you 
and everything will be about you, are you willing to say, I don't care if I'm 10, 15, 20, 60, 80, 90, my life is going to be lived for the glory of God. And when you begin to grow, you'll begin to say to yourself, you know what, I now see the most important thing in my life. And that is my life is given glory back to the one who gave me life. Amen to that? Jesus gave you his life, and now he wants you to give him your life to be a living testimony to his goodness and grace. And there's nothing better that when you're able to see growth happening in your life, where little by little, but surely, you're beginning to show Christ-like characters in your life. Jesus loved and cared for people, and he walked and he talked with people. Is that you? He, he loved, he gave, he forgave. And all these things we can look at and go, Jesus, I see that in my life, or I don't. That's okay. But see, this is the thing. It's the power of intention. I can't hit a target unless I'm looking at the target, and I intend to hit the target. You can't, you can't run a half marathon or a two-point, whatever it might be. You can't do that unless you're willing to get up out of your seat and walk down to the end of your driveway. And then the next week, you go a walk down your road. And maybe a little further than that, you're able to walk a half a mile. And then after that, a mile. See, we have to intend to do these things. Intention is so important in our life. You can't graduate from high school unless you're willing to get up and go to school. You can't graduate and be a productive person at work until you're willing to say, I want to develop skills so that someone will hire me. Intention is so important. And today I just want to leave with saying to ourselves, we must intend, not wish. Oh, I wish. No, 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 no. We're willing to say, I want to put this in practical parts of my life. Lord, I not only intend, but I am going to put forth the effort to grow in my life. Now listen, if anybody has a smartphone, take it out right now. This is the one time in the year that I'm going to tell you to pull out your smartphones. There are, uh, we are putting together more opportunities in our church so that we can grow. We're having more small groups meeting on Sunday morning. We're having groups. We want to develop groups all the way throughout the week. Men's group. We need another men's group. We have a group that meets tonight. We have a, 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 a once a month breakfast meeting. But we like to develop a way throughout the week that five or six men can get together and talk. I want to start a leadership group. There are people in our church that are dealing with God's leading in their life. And I want to help them develop a leadership group that can help people that may feel like, I may feel called in the ministry. What does that look like? See, we have all these ways, and I, I want to say to you, you may say, Sean, I want to become part of a small group. Those are the times and places we'll grow. And here's a parenting group right here. Beginning September 11th, Strengthening Families begins its third year, I think, here in our church. You may say, my need right now is to learn how to parent or find tips of parent. Here's a group. You'll find all this outside in our foyer. The same, that, this is Monday night. On that next Wednesday, we're going to have a group called Trust-Based Parenting, how to develop connection with your kids. These are all free. See, there are ways that we can do this in our church. If you're saying to yourself, Sean, my week is so busy, I can't get here personally, but I wouldn't mind being a part of a virtual group on Zoom or Teams or any other video conferencing ways, I will be glad to be a part of that. We have to intend and we have to put forth the effort. I'm telling you, if you're willing just to step forward and do something, you can. Now, take your, take your smartphones here and I'm just gonna show you here just for a second. Go to the church app and uh, you may say, well, I don't even know where the church app is. You can go to either Wherever your phone, your operating system will take you either to Apple or to Google, and you can go to their stores for the app, and you can just put this in, Faith Community Church, and then the abbreviation for Tennessee. So it's Faith Community Church, TN. It's a free download, but just look here. You may say to yourself, well, 
how do I find out opportunities? How do I ask the church to help me with this? You can go to the home page, and then there's the next steps tab. And you can hit that, or you can hit the I'm new tab, and you can just find out a way to let us know I'm interested in becoming involved with men's ministry. I'm looking forward to do something through the week on a small group. Anyway, see down at the very bottom of that home page, there's a connect tab as well. And all I'm trying to say is on the smartphone, if you download our app, look at this. Some of you may say, you know what? I want to start at ground one or ground zero. I would like to start reading the Bible. Well, see on this, you see the little prompt that Stacy is putting right there? Down at the very bottom of the page, you can see home, which takes us back to the home page, events. The third little button down there is called the Bible. And you can just tap on that Bible, and it'll pull up the whole Bible beginning in Genesis. But you can actually go to a reading plan. There's a little pop-up window down at the very bottom that says plan. And you can hit that plan, and I just did that this week. And it'll automatically give you an Old Testament reading, a, a reading from Psalms, which is in the middle, which is like a prayer book of the Bible. And it gives you a New Testament reading. There are ways in our church to help with this as we move forward. Now, I just want to let you know also on our website, fccnaz.org, faithcommunitynazarene.org, fccnaz. You can go there, and there's a way for you at the very beginning to know that you can connect with us. There's a, 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 on the left-hand side, if you want to look at it that way, you can kind of see a connect tab. There's a new, yeah, all those different ways for you to connect, contact us. You can find out different ways to be involved in the life of the church. And I just want to share this with people in our community that you are looking and saying to yourself, man, I need to get involved. Well, let us know. I just want to let you know one last thing because we have Facebook. You see all those different ways here, about and connect. Both those tabs have ways for you to contact the church. And you can just put your name down, what you want to do, how there are ways to right there. And you can just go down and fill this out, and we'll get information to you. But we need everybody to step forward and say, I want to be a part of growing in my faith. And when you grow in your faith, that'll prompt others to grow in their faith as well. One last thing I want to give to you is my email, sean at fccnaz.org. Some of you say, Sean, I have a hard time getting you. Well, I want to say this with kindness, but I'm not sitting at my desk twirling my fingers waiting for you to call me. If that's the kind of pastor you want, that's not the pastor I'm going to be. I'm seeing people and being involved in different things. I'm trying to help this church and be involved in the community and caring for the people of our church. But if you write me an email, sean at fccnaz.org, I'll respond to you, and I'll let you know. I'll meet with you anywhere. I'll come to your work. I'll meet you for lunch. I'll meet you for breakfast. I'll meet you night, morning, whatever it may be, because I, if you have a desire to grow, I'll meet with you any place, and we'll sit down and go through a way that you can't find growth in your life. Amen to that? See, the thing is, Peter says, grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Step back one, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and you're willing to grow in grace, your life will bear much fruit. Amen to that? And I pray today that you and I are willing to say, you know what? It's the greatest thing in life to know Jesus. And I'm willing to put forth effort so that his grace can become more part. I see so many of these things. I want to grow. And I want to tell you, I've been around the block a, a time or two. Is that you? Maybe you've been around the block. But there's always areas to grow in your Christian life. Always time, always ways for us to grow. Hey, Bailey, come on up. 
I want to sing the bridge that graves into garden. Oh, there's, there's nothing like following Jesus. Amen to that?